Functionalism is one of the most promising views for psychological physicalists who are trying to explain what the mind is. But does it go too far? Let's consider. Hello philosophers, I'm Chico. Welcome to The Philosopher Show, where we consider the greatest questions of human history. Recently I did a video about functionalism, but I thought it might be good to start off this video uh, reviewing a lot of the stuff about functionalism so we'll truly understand what this objection is all about. First, I would say that functionalism starts off with four important premises or four important presuppositions more. The first is that psychological physicalism is true. And remember what that meant was that when we're doing philosophy of mind, the only kinds of things that exist are physical things. The second was that psychological discourse is true for human beings. So when I say stuff like, uh, I have a mind, uh, I feel pain, um, I'm thinking about the sandwich I had earlier, all those kinds of things, that's psychological discourse, not physical discourse. When I say thoughts and feelings and minds, right, you can't open up my skull and see a bunch of thoughts running around. So those kinds of things are true for human beings. The third presupposition is the multiple realizability theorem. And remember, this is really important for functionalism specifically, which is th that uh, there are some things, maybe not in existence, maybe just hypothetically, but there could be things that uh, are not human beings, but also the psychological discourse is true for in the same kind of way that it is true for humans. So there could be aliens, there could be androids, there could be things that have thoughts and that have feelings and all that kind of stuff. It, would, it could be true for those kinds of entities. And then finally, psychological uh, discourse is not true for everything. It's not true for rocks, right? Something like that. There's a set of things for which it is not true. Now, the big question for functionalists is what makes presupposition two here true? And to answer that question in such a way as, as it's compatible with presuppositions one, three, and four. So what I mean by that is presupposition two, what makes it true that humans have, that psychological discourse is true for humans? Well, um, I could say maybe like they have this non-physical mind, right? That this thing that that is, uh, inside there somewhere, but is not identical to the brain. And then I could look at presupposition three and say, ah, look, so the aliens have this non-physical mind too. We have the same kinds of mind, great. But that would conflict with presupposition one, which is that only physical things exist. I could say instead that, well, it's the brain, right? What makes it true that human beings, you know, when I say I have a mind that makes that true, it's not that I have a mind that is non-physical or that I have real thoughts. It's that I have a brain and all those words correspond to the brain. Yeah, but when I talk about aliens and, and robots in premise or presupposition three, that's going to conflict there because they're not going to have the same kind of brain as a human has. So we're left here trying to figure out how can I make it sense of this? How can I answer presupposition two? How can I explain presupposition two and still uh, be able to assert presuppositions one, three, and four? And four we'll talk about a little bit more later. And remember for functionalists, the answer that they're going to point to is that psychological discourse, uh, human brains and alien brains and computer CPUs and all those kinds of things that can think or we would attribute minds to, they all have the same functional organization. So to start off with, Take all of our psychological discourse, all the talk about the mind and how one thought would lead to another thought, which would lead to an action, all those kinds of things. Well, the idea here is that you'd find some kind of functional organization with all those different entities that it sounds like we're positing, like thoughts and feelings and things. There's some kind of job that each one of them would do. So for a, a very simplistic uh, example, consider the statement, I saw the sandwich and I was hungry, so I ate it and I was happy. Well, here we have an input seeing the sandwich, we have a state of being or a state of mind, which would be the, the hungriness. And then we have an output, which would be a behavior, which is the eating of the sandwich and a, a new state, a, a happiness, a state of mind. For functionalism, the important idea here is going to be that for humans, the reason that psychological discourse is true is because we have a physical thing inside of us for which the same functional organization it applies, right? It, it realizes the functional organization of our psychological discourse. So for example, when I said that uh, I see a sandwich, I was hungry, so I ate and I was happy. Well, that first input, seeing the sandwich, that refers to an experience, seeing. So there's this physical uh, input that corresponds to that, which is the you know photons hitting our retinas and sending 
messages to our occipital lobes. And then when we talk about being in the mind state of feeling hungry, feeling is a mind state, right? You can't look inside your body and see any feelings running around. So that would be corresponding to like ghrelin being released in, in the stomach and a low glucose in the, in the brain. And then when we talk about the output, right, which would be the, the behavior, we really, you know, that is a physical behavior, which is eating the sandwich. So we don't have to really worry about that. And then finally, we have that second mind state, which is the happiness, feeling happy. Well, that would correspond to a physical state in, in the human, which would be a release of dopamine and serotonin. Now, notice that we have two different types of discourse here. We have psychological discourse and physical discourse. When we talk about psychological discourse, all those mind type words like feelings and, and thoughts. When we talk about physical discourse, we're talking about stuff like glucose and serotonin and things like that. So for functionalism in one story, the psychological discourse, that's pure fiction, right? That is like abstract talk and there's no real things like minds and feelings and stuff like that. So you think that you're experiencing something, you're not actually experiencing anything. You don't actually feel hungry. Instead, what's true is the physical discourse. That thing is the true thing, right? So you instead, what's happening is you're getting glucose and, and uh, being low and then serotonin, dopamine, all, all those kinds of words that I'm just looking up and throwing out there at you because I don't really know these things, right? Uh, all those kinds of words uh, are, are the words, those are the real things, but thoughts and feelings are not real things. But since they have the same functional organization, since the story we tell about the mind and everything matches structurally with the, the physical stuff that's going on in the brain and other parts of the body possibly, then we can say that the, uh, the human brain realizes the mind, right? It makes true that functional organization of the mind. And notice what this move has done for functionalists. Now they've resolved presuppositions one and two because they can say that talk about the mind is true by saying, oh yeah, when we talk about the mind, we're talking about the physical stuff in a human being realizing talk about the mind or having basically having the same functional organization as this story we come up with the mind. And they can also be psychological physicalists because they're saying the mind stuff doesn't exist, right? That non-physical stuff is non-existent, the only thing that exists is the physical stuff. And now we may wonder about presupposition three. Well, notice, since what I'm doing here, is, what I should say what the functionalist is doing here, is really just taking a story about the mind, matching it up with the physical structure of the brain and human beings, well, it could, they could do the same move for aliens and robots. So long as an alien has a physical structure that realizes this psychological discourse, the functional organization in this psychological discourse, um, so long as they're structured the same, in other words, then we can say that the alien has a mind in the same way that we said that the human being has a mind. Now, of course, when we're talking about aliens instead of humans, it, in that physical story we told, we're gonna have to substitute out stuff, but we'll still have the same structure. So instead of you know serotonin and dopamine, uh, I might have uh, shmeratonin and shmopamine. But again, as long as it's got the same structure, no problem. That is what we mean when we say that a human has a mind or an alien has a mind, according to functionalists. You know, in fact, one last, uh, I, I, know, I know maybe I've explained this to death and I apologize if I have, but I think it's it's something that's hard to, to get your, stuck in your mind, right? To, to really, uh, you understand it first and then like it just sort of slips out there and then to, to really grasp it. Um, you could think of the seat on a stool versus a tire. And I might say that they both are circles. And when I say that they are both circles, do I mean that there is some you know, ghost circle that is placed on top of the stool and it's placed on the tire there? No, what I mean is I've abstracted a shape or a structure from the stool and I've abstracted that exact same structure from the tire. It's true to say that they're both circles, but only because the physical thing has that kind of a structure that this abstract thing a circle would have. But we don't see circles just kicking it somewhere, right? Like those are abstract objects. So in order to really understand the liberalism objection that we're gonna talk about uh, to functionalism, I'm gonna lay out functionalism's reasoning here in a little boring and logical kind of way. Just stick with me through this. I realize for some of you guys, you didn't come here for the one, two, three premises and stuff like that, but I think it'll help us to see really what the uh, liberalist objection is getting at. First, a couple definitions. Let's define C-mind as the common sense mind. And what I mean by common sense mind is not that it's just common sense. What I mean by common sense 
is pre-philosophical ideas, right? So this is psychological discourse. This is the way we usually would we would usually say, I feel hungry and I uh, am having a visual experience. And all those kinds of words all wrapped up together, and we call that the mind. Typically, that's how we would talk. We'll call that kind of a mind a C mind. And an F mind, we'll call a functionalist mind. And an F mind just means whatever happens to have the same functional organization as the C mind, as stuff like thoughts and feelings, all that stuff wrapped up into one. If there is something that has that same kind of organization, things are doing the same jobs as thoughts and feelings over here in the C mind, then that has an F mind. Now, the functionalist way of reasoning is something like this. Number one, psychological physicalism. The C mind is just a fiction. It's just a story, it's not real. But premise two here, even though it is just a fiction here, C minds have some kind of, the story here, right? The C mind has some kind of structure some kind of functional organization to it. In premise three, the human brain has the same structure, has the same functional organization as the C mind. So four, by definition, the human brain or the humans themselves have an F mind. Premise five, when we use the word mind, we should mean F mind, you know, not C mind. We should, we should specifically mean F mind. Therefore, six, humans have a mind. Now, of course, we can run the same style of reasoning using aliens or robots in place of humans here, and that's what makes functionalism you know, so attractive. So when we evaluate this, what can we, uh, what can we look at as possibly objectionable? Uh, we have premises one, two, three, and five. Those are not conclusions, right? Those are, are the premises here. So we can look at those guys and Two doesn't seem all that objectionable, right? One there is something that's assumed by all the philosophies of mind that we've been looking at so far. So we're gonna treat one in a, a totally separate you know, section here, not just functionalism, but also limited. All those guys together assume that. So yeah, we'll look at that at the very end. And then uh, premise three might be false. I don't really know. I'm not a neuroscientist. I think neuroscientists and uh, psychologists have got to get together and one says, hey, here's the structure of the mind. And one says, hey, here's the structure of the brain. And then I don't, I mean, the science isn't there yet, I'm pretty sure. So uh, I don't think they could do that yet, but that's something that we can only determine uh, upon further scientific investigation. It ain't a job for a philosopher. For us right now in this video, we'll look at that premise five here. When we say mind, should we mean an F mind? Should we mean, yeah, it just happens to have the same functional organization as a C mind? Is that what we mean or should we, we should mean by the word mind? I think probably the most plausible argument for functionalism is that it's just useful. So what do I mean by that? Uh, we have certain, uh, this is how a functionalist would argue, we have certain goals or, or certain things that we're trying to accomplish as human beings, which is which are different than as a sack of atoms, you know? I mean, we could be described as just a collection of atoms and physics would take care of, uh, of all the explanations there. But uh, as a living being, I have other things that I'm trying to accomplish, which is like stay alive or interact with other living beings. So when you tell me that I have certain, you know, chemicals that are being released in my brain and in my stomach, um, great. But if you tell me I'm hungry, Oh, that makes a lot more sense. And now, this is especially true for functionalists when we're talking about other kinds of creatures. Because if an alien were to tell me, you know, uh, I have low schmucose levels right now, I'd be like, what the heck is schmucose? But if he tells me I am hungry, I'm, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, let's get you some food. So, in other words, because we would get similar results for saying that this alien has a mind and saying that the human has a mind, given this definition of minds as F minds then uh, we should just define minds as F minds. That's really the big argument here for functionalists. That was a lot of review on what functionalism is, I, I realize that, but here's the payoff, the liberalism objection. The liberalism objection is to premise five here, which is to say that there would be some things that have F minds that don't have minds, or that we shouldn't say or we wouldn't say have minds. So in other words, the very thing that's making uh, presuppositions two and three both true together is also gonna make presupposition four false. It's gonna give minds to things that we say don't have minds. So for example, pretend like the brain and the mind and 
the alien brain, all, all the stuff that we talked about so far, we, we've given a very, very simple functional organization there. Pretend that's the only thing to these things. Pretend the only thing to a mind is two psychological states and one input and one output, that's all you got. Well, a mousetrap would have the same thing. A mousetrap would start off in one physical state, which is you know unsprung and, and, and ready to go, and you would give one input, which is a little bit of pressure, and then you would have one output, which is uh, you know killing a mouse, and then you would have one last physical state here, which is a sprung mousetrap. So given this functional organization, the mousetrap would have the same functional organization as our, our C mind here, right? So the mousetrap would have an F mind, but of course we wouldn't say that a mousetrap has a mind. Now, the, obviously the problem here is that the, the C mind, psychological discourse, way more complex than just you know, two states and one input and one output. So what we really need then is to show that there could be a functional organization that's just exactly the same as our psychological discourse, it's exactly the same as our C mind, but uh, is something weird like a mousetrap that we wouldn't say has a mind. It would be incredible here if I could go out and show you something like a mousetrap that has a, an F mind here and say like, look, here, here's exactly, here, here's a real life instance. The problem is we don't have some perfect map of the mind or the brain even, you know, we don't have that kind of stuff. So. I can't go out and find something like that. So uh, instead, second best thing is gonna be here, uh, a thought experiment. This thought experiment is called the Chinese brain, and this is by philosopher Ned Block. And I'm not really sure how this went down in his time because at that time, it was thought that there were 100 billion neurons in a brain and there was like a billion people in China. So I don't know, maybe each citizen was connected to 100 uh, neurons, but let, let, let's change it a little. Right now there's 1.4 billion people in China and people think that there's 85 billion neurons in the brain. I don't know, like I don't think anybody's gone and counted every one, but something like that. And let's say that uh, for President Xi Jinping's birthday, it was Mao Zedong in that blocks uh, example here. But so let's say for President Xi's uh, birthday, Huawei comes up with this crazy celebration uh, where they connect every neuron in President Xi's brain to a Chinese citizen. And I know that there's like, you know, there's there's a mismatch here, so let's just pretend that every Chinese citizen had 120, or every couple had 120 kids, and that added up to, you know, 85 million. So, and, and if there's not enough space, I know, I, I don't think there's not enough space in China. China's huge, but uh, maybe they colonize Mars or something like that. So uh, whatever we need to change up. I know this is getting bizarre here, but that's okay, right? It could be as bizarre as we want. But so let's say, you know, Huawei connects a 5G connection between each neuron and each Chinese citizen and uh, also connects each of the Chinese citizens together in the exact same way as the neurons are connected in President Xi's brain. So whenever any kind of uh, neural pathway is actualized in President Xi's brain, the same pathway is actualized in the Chinese brain. This is what he called it, right? This Chinese citizens all put together. So uh, it looks like we have identical functional organization here, right? We, we have uh, uh, an actual brain and we have this brain full of citizens and they're, they're organized in the exact same way. And yet we would definitely say President Xi has a mind, but it's really bizarre to say that the Chinese brain has a mind. So the, the argument goes that we should not mean by the word mind an F mind. Now there are, are a couple of ways you could respond to this objection, uh, but I think probably the most plausible one here is that, well, technically speaking, it is a mind. Uh, and what I mean by that is remember that Functionalism has very modest goals here. <laughs> They're not trying to show you that an alien and a human being have real minds. They're not trying to show you, in other words, that, well, I should say, they're not trying to show you that sea minds are real and that uh, you know the, the experiences that a human has are the same as the experiences an alien has. They don't believe that humans and aliens are actually having experiences, are actually thinking things. They don't believe in any of those kinds of things. So to say that the Chinese brain has a mind 
All we mean by that is it's got a certain kind of organization. That's all that a functionalist means by that word. So we're not trying to, and that's what I think the force of Ned Block's uh, example here is exactly that, is that like, look, you're saying that this thing has a mind, but how can this thing have a mind? And you picture like consciousness just sort of <laughs> emerging from from this weird structure here and it seems just bizarre. Seems like it, it seems like something we wouldn't want to say. But all they're really saying here is that, yeah, it's got the same structure as the human mind and the human mind is the same structure as the alien mind. So in other words, it sounds weird until we realize that there really isn't that much that a functionalist is, is, is trying to accomplish here. However, even so, even with that limited goal here, there, there could be some further objections, which uh, sound a little bit like this. The word mind here was defined pragmatically. We said that the reason we would want to say that an alien and a human both have a mind is because we might have the same goals to accomplish with both aliens and humans. For the same word to, I mean, I have goals for lots of stuff. I have goals for my surfboard, right? For the same word to apply to both things, we would have to be use. It would have to be useful in the same way. There would have to be a reason for us to call them both a mind because they're useful in that same way. But the Chinese brain here isn't useful in that same way, right? There's not the same kind of use that I would have for calling a human being something with a mind and an alien with a mind. And to make this point super clear, imagine that this uh, this Chinese brain here gets all the same inputs that President Xi gets and has the same functional organization as his brain, and all the outputs, however, are just a light show. And so if you know, if you were to tickle President Xi, uh, and he would giggle, I think, um, well, with a Chinese brain, instead, it would just sh shoot green lights. And if I were to call President Xi bad names, and he would start to cry, the same inputs would come to the Chinese brain. Instead of uh, green lights, now we're gonna have red lights. And so really, you know, it has the same functional organization, right? Inputs, same structure, outputs, but the outputs, I'm not gonna have the same use for them that I would have for the outputs of the alien and a human. So even though they have the same functional organization, it's not useful for me to say that this Chinese brain has a mind. Well, the problem is, if it's not useful, to say that the Chinese brain has a mind, but it does have an F mind, by hypothesis, right? It has an F mind, a functionalist mind. Then the fact that we've defined the word mind here pragmatically would mean that having an F mind is not sufficient for having a mind. So even if we define the word mind pragmatically, seems like this would be a bad idea. We shouldn't use the word mind to cover functionalist minds. Another uh, part of this objection, or I should say another part of this example that Ned Block has here that I haven't talked about is he says something like pretend, okay, so the, the Chinese brain is having uh, all the same inputs that President Xi is having, and let's say all of a sudden President Xi gets a headache. And does the Chinese brain get a headache? You know, what do we say here? Um, and I think the force of that objection is really more to point to qualia arguments. So that's something that we're gonna talk about later. That's not something we're gonna bring up in this one. So if you're wondering like what, he didn't talk about the headache part, that's a very interesting part, but um, I think it's a second objection or, or a second possible objection. Maybe that's what he meant by this example, but I, I don't know, I don't know the guy, so. In any case, if you have any questions about what we talked about today, please feel free to hit me up on the, on the comments. Um, also please, like and subscribe, it really helps me uh, to grow my channel. And my wife tells me to say that, I don't know, I, I think it's weird, but <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll see you guys in the next video, adios.